back. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We want to welcome you back again. Today in this session, we are honored to have Christine on with us. Christine is the executive director of Women Cross DMV. And this is a global movement of women mobilizing to end the Korean War. And to us, to CPCS, uh, Christine, as well as uh, Women Cross DMZ, has been an important partner of us uh, on the work of uh, on the Korean Peninsula. So whenever we have meetings or conferences, Christine is not just bringing in her expertise, her experience and insights, but also her energy and her passion for the work. And some of you may, may have known that Christine is in Hawaii, and that is why she needs to stay awake until late night or just wake up in the middle of the night for many Zoom calls, for many online meetings, because you know right now part of our work, part of the work of many people has moved online now. So we see commitment, we see persistence in her. And more importantly, we see her passion for the people who are still in, uh, living under the threats of war and conflict. So today, Christine is going to share on the topic, the power of civil society movements for political change, uh, particularly speaking from her experience of movements organizing and how to engage with policy makers. So ladies and gentlemen, please be ready to listen to this energizing sharing from Christine. Over to you, Christine. Thank you so much, Allison. That is so, that might have been the best internet. So thank you. And that energizing um, DJ, Emma, <laughs> um, that was so fabulous. I was um, instantly awakened by coming into the Zoom room. So thank you so much for um, having me and greetings from Hawaii, which uh, it is um, almost 1 a.m. And uh, I will do my best to be energizing, but uh, yeah, it's been a long day and I did not take a nap, which I usually try to do when I um, give talks like this. But um, I'm just really honored to be with you. Allison shared um, the list of uh, all the countries you're joining in from and and the organizations you represent. It's just an honor to be with you. Um, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share the story of, of Women Cross DMZ. Um, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna first talk a little bit. I'm gonna give a PowerPoint and then I'm gonna end with a short little video. And hopefully you will stay awake uh, wherever you are through the most of it, but I would really like to leave a lot of time for, um, for Q and A. Um, I'm just deeply uh, honored to be connected to Emma and to Allison and to CPCS. They have been amazing friends on the work of um, peace on the Korean Peninsula. And in fact, I was just there a year ago. Uh, we, I missed Emma, but I was uh, just there because CPCS helped arrange a meeting with me and uh, a, a colleague from, from the DPRK, which you know is says so much about CPCS that they have that power of convening and providing a safe space for people to meet and gather and to have dialogue. So I'm certain that you all have amazing stories and examples from your own communities and from your own countries of how civil society movements are realizing political change. So I'm gonna keep my remarks brief um, so that we can have an extensive discussion, we can share and we can inspire each other. I wanna learn as much as um, I'm about to impart information to you. But first, let me say I'm fascinated by the theme of this conference, the title, and feel that in describing the Korean peace process, the words could be switched to quote, moving beyond big man diplomacy, um, because for those who have been following um, the Korea peace process that began with the Winter Olympics in 2018 in Pyeongchang, um, we really did feel that peace was on the brink of breaking out actually with the dramatic summits between the North and the South Korean leader, between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Um, but then as we know, that peace process came to a grinding halt 
I wonder how much has to do with um, the big man diplomacy. Uh, I suspect some, um, but I think the point is, is it's the people and, the, and our power to reclaim our role in that diplomatic process so that it just doesn't end when the big men fail, but when the people keep pushing and realizing peace for the Korean Peninsula. So I was actually in Hanoi in 2019 when the summit abruptly ended. Many of you may remember watching that. Many of you maybe were in Vietnam um, watching it and feeling the mood of, uh, you know, I remember the motorcades, the, the North Korean motorcades driving through Hanoi and people gathering on the streets. It was almost as if it was a celebration. Um, and, you know, obviously Vietnam played such a historic role uh, in ending uh, war with the United States. So we thought, okay, this is a great place for the war to end between the US and North Korea. On that day when Trump and Kim met, I had just spoken to my six-year-old daughter and I explained to her today, you know, I have to always explain to my daughter because I was traveling so much for work. Today, Jeju is gonna be the day that uh, the leaders of the United States and North Korea, they end the Korean War. And I, uh, I really truly felt it. Uh, I, I thought, wow, this is a day that actually the Korean people can start to live in peace. But by lunchtime, you know, the talks had collapsed. You can imagine the pandemonium that was uh, at the International Press Conference Center. Everybody was wondering what had happened. Uh, Donald Trump gave this uh, incoherent explanation, his explanation of why talks failed. But, you know, I have to say that the hardest part of uh, the aftermath of that news was actually going to the room where the South Korean journalists were. Uh, it was a, a collective feeling of doom. The air was heavy, the room was silent. You could feel just how disappointed the Korean people were that they were not able to come to a deal. So instead of returning back to the United States defeated, I was even more certain and emboldened that the war would not end unless we, we the people, we the social movements, we the civil society actors organized and demanded it of our political leaders. So today I would like to share with you the story of Women Cross DMZ. And I'm gonna just quickly Tell me when you, um, can you see that? Yes, okay, cool. Um, so this is the story of Women Cross DMZ. It's a transnational feminist movement that we've helped build and to mobilize uh, women for peace in Korea. Now, let me just say that I have no illusions that uh, what we have been able to build is exactly replicable, especially the resources that we've leveraged from the United States, which I know is the wealthiest country in the world. But it has been inspiring for me to witness the small but significant political changes in South Korea, in the United States, and I imagine also in North Korea. And to know that the organizing by women peace activists had a hand in shaping those changes. I wanna share with you five strategies that we've used as civil society actors to help advance peace on the Korean Peninsula. But first, let me explain the genesis of Women Cross DMZ, which literally began with a dream. In 2019, I was working at the Global Fund for Women. Many of you may know that organization. It's based in San Francisco. It's the largest women's fund. They fund women's um, groups all around the world. And uh, I was working by day uh, at the organization. And by moonlight, I was a Korea peace activist. We had just launched an initiative called Women Dismantling Militarism. And we had screened this film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. I don't know if many of you have seen it. It's about the women in Liberia and their peace building, crossing religious and ethnic lines to bring an end to Liberia's 17 year civil war. Well, that night I woke up in the middle of the night 
and like many of us insomniacs, and I'm sure there's many of you with all the traveling that you do for work, I turned on my computer and on the home page of the New York Times was a story about the Imjin River, which is a river that runs through the heart of the Korean Peninsula, north to south. It was during the rainy season and the river was flooding and North Korea uh, allegedly lifted the dam without informing South Korea. And several people, including a father and his son, were swept away and drowned, including a father and his son who were fishing in the early morning. The two leaders at the time were Kim Jong-il in the North, the current uh, leader's father, Kim Jong-un, and Lee Myung-bak, who was the former uh, executive from Hyundai, who is now actually serving time in prison in South Korea for his corruption. Well, the hotline was cut off between the two Koreas, so there was no official communication. I remember reading this very article and actually being quite pissed off. Why couldn't one man just pick up the phone and call the other man? I, uh, I, I just couldn't understand how that lack of communication was still killing people's lives. And I decided to go back to sleep. And that's when I had the most incredible dream. I was waiting in the river and it was just before, this is my dream. I was waiting in the river, it was about chest high and it was right before the, the break of dawn. And I was situated in the South because I was born in South Korea. That's where most of my family is from. And uh, before the sun rose, there was a light that was kind of coming down this river. And this is actually a photo of the Imjin River. And that light started to morph into um, the embrace of elderly Koreans. I don't know if you've ever seen or witnessed elderly Koreans who uh, have are seeing their siblings after 60, 70 years. Um, it is the most heart-wrenching thing to witness. Um, you know, it's like their brothers, their lovers, uh, their mothers. Uh, it, it just kills you to think that Korean people have been separated for three generations. And it was such a powerful thing to watch, but in some ways, I just wanted to know where the source of the light was coming from. And so I decided to continue wading up the river. I wanted to know where that light was coming from. And that's when I came to the most incredible sight, which was a circle of women. And they were sitting around a big black kettle and stirring some thick liquid like witches and they then poured whatever they were stirring into little vessels that then became the light floating down the river. And it was at that moment I woke up and I, you know, hit my then husband um, at the time. And I said, you would, you were not going to believe this, but I know who will end the war. It will be women. Women will end the Korean war. Now you can imagine it was like 5 a.m. for him and he was like, okay. And I was like, yeah, you're right. How are we going to end the war? Um, and so I decided I needed to do some research. And I learned that in fact, the first meeting of North and South Korean women in 1991, which was nearly 40 years after the Korean war was halted, was organized with the help of a Japanese woman who was actually a member of the Japanese diet. And for those of you that know the history of the last century, you know that Korea was colonized for 35 years by Japan. So what a significant role that this woman had played to help bring the first meeting of North and South Korean women. And what that told me was that in times of impasse between the two Koreas, the international community and we activists, civil society actors have a role to play to help break that stalemate. And so um, I took that dream. And my good friend and mentor, Gloria Steinem, who is a well-known American feminist, hopefully around the world, but definitely in the United States, um, she says, without leaps of imagination or dreaming, we lose the excitement of possibilities. Dreaming, after all, 
is a form of planning. And I took this, I printed it out, I put it on my desk by my computer, and I just set off on this dream of how will women end the Korean War. So in 2015, on the 70th anniversary of Korea's division, which many of you hopefully will know that Korean people didn't choose to divide the Korean Peninsula, but it was actually by the United States and the former Soviet Union. Korea had been a, you know, a, a colony of Japan. So when Japan was defeated after the US uh, dropped two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, you know, they didn't know what to do with the Korean Peninsula. So they decided to tear a page from the National Geographic magazine and draw a line across the 38th parallel. And President Truman at the time sent a memo to Joseph Stalin and said, you can take north of the 38th parallel and Pyongyang and we'll take south, which includes Seoul. How Korea became divided. No Korean was consulted. And you can imagine uh, the injustice that the Koreans still feel today about this thousands, thousands year old country basically being divided by Cold War power. So on this 70th anniversary, I set out to organize a women's peace walk across the demilitarized zone from North Korea to South Korea. The Korean War, which was from 1950 to 1953, it just temporarily ended with a ceasefire agreement, the armistice agreement. And the military commanders from North Korea, from the United States representing the UN command, and China agreed to return within actually 90 days to negotiate a permanent peace settlement. Well, they have never done that. And so that is the root cause of the unresolved conflict. That is the root cause of why North Korea keeps pursuing nuclear weapons to defend its sovereignty, to defend against a preemptive strike from the United States. And so we felt that we needed to do something to bring international attention to this injustice of an unresolved Korean War. And so we made headlines when we brought together 30 women peace builders from around the world to cross the DMZ and included Nobel Peace Laureates, Mairead McGuire from Northern Ireland, Laima Gaboe from Liberia, and um, the American feminist icon, Gloria Steinem. We held peace symposiums in Pyongyang, and in Seoul, where we heard North and South Korean women talk about the, how the Korean War still impacted their lives. And we walked, we walked with 10,000 women on both sides of the border. With this act, we called for a formal end to the Korean War with the peace agreement. We called for the reunion of separated families and we called for women's involvement in the peace process. And since our crossing, our calls for peace have become even louder and more urgent, especially as you may remember in 2017, in the era of fire and fury, when the United States and President Trump threatened to totally destroy North Korea. And the US and North Korea came da dangerously close to another war. So we have continued on our call for an end to the Korean War with the peace agreement and here are five strategies that we have used as civil society actors to see political change to end the Korean War. So number one, we continue to bring women together across boundaries. The initial goal of our 2015 crossing was for women from North and South Korea and around the world to cross the DMZ together in a symbolic act. Unfortunately, that was not possible. Uh, only the international women were able to cross, but we never stopped trying. In February, 2016, Women Cross DMC tried to bring North and South Korean women together in Indonesia. Many of you may be are from Indonesia. And that is actually one, uh, one of a handful of countries where North and South Korean women can actually meet and feel safe. So we succeeded in bringing six women from the DPRK who ranged in their ages from 20s to their 60s, and many who had participated in the Women's Peace Symposium in Pyongyang. Well, many of these women had never left North Korea. For many of them, this was the first time they ever had a passport. 
And unfortunately, uh, just before the meeting, North Korea tested a nuclear weapon. And so the president at the time in South Korea was Park Geun-hye. And uh, as retribution for that testing, she prohibited the South Korean women from going to meet the North Korean women. And you know they were willing and ready to uh, basically get arrested and fined. But at the same time, they had endured so much red baiting. Many had um, been threatened to lose their jobs. They were harassed uh, for their organizing of the 2015 crossing. And so ultimately they decided not to meet their counterparts. And so instead we had to hold back-to-back -back meetings. Well, after multiple attempts, finally in 2018 in Beijing, we brought together North and South Korean women together with women from China, from Japan, Russia, the US and Canada for the first ever Northeast Asia Women's Peace and Security Roundtable. Unfortunately, we faced enormous challenges. It was uh, right at that politically fraught time when the Huawei uh, case was erupting between Canada and, uh, and China um, as you know, result between the US and China. And thankfully, we were still able to meet in the Canadian embassy, but still it was a very stressful time to be gathering and it was a very actually difficult and hostile place to gather. But still we talked, we laughed, we shared meals and we discussed how we can achieve a more peaceful future with women at the peacemaking table. In fact, one of the women that uh, helped organize the meeting was Jackie O'Neill, who is now the first woman peace and security ambassador to Canada. And, you know, it was really an amazing experience to look at the different models from around the world and conflicts where women have pushed for a seat at the, at, at the negotiating table. And it was just really fascinating to see there were so many different ways that civil society actors have actually pushed for their inclusion in the peace process. So that's number one. Number two, we launched a global campaign called Korea Peace Now. In 2019, Women Cross TMZ with Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, it's the oldest women's peace organization, the Nobel Women's Initiative, and the Korean Women's Movement for Peace, um, which includes four longstanding South Korean women's peace organizations. We came together to launch this campaign, Korea Peace Now, Women Mobilizing to End War. Well, thanks to a, six, a $2 million grant that we received from the Nova Foundation, we launched that spring in four cities in Washington, DC, in New York, in Ottawa, and in Seoul. Now we actually had the means to bring women together from all over the globe to strategize and to work together towards our shared goals of ending the war with a peace agreement. And um, that, I can't even tell you, the resources are so important, but still it's just the ability to come together and to strategize. I can't tell you enough how important that is um, the third strategy is we highlighted through our research the impact of sanctions on North Korean people. And unfortunately, despite the US and North Korea committing to a new relationship at the 2018 Singapore summit, the Trump administration continued to maintain a policy of maximum pressure, which is uh, crippling sanctions and the threat of military action to compel North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons. Well, not only have, has this strategy failed to achieve denuclearization, um, it has severely harmed the North Korean people's lives. So to highlight the violence that sanctions um, impose on ordinary people, we commissioned a, a multidisciplinary panel of experts, including humanitarian workers with all the on the ground experience with legal experts, and they produced this report, The Human Cost and Gendered Impact of Sanctions on North Korea. We felt the moment was ripe to push back against the US and the UN Security Council on these sanctions, especially since it has been a huge obstacle to advancing the peace process. So we released this report in Geneva and also in New York, uh, you know, about a year ago to the state, and we held many 
um, closed door meetings with UN missions from many countries, including Sweden, Canada, and South Korea. We held high profile events like at the Council on Foreign Relations, and we briefed the editors of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, which ultimately broke the story. We got wide coverage. You can see some of these uh, articles, Voice of America, USA Today, uh, Forbes magazine. It stimulated a conversation among the UN panel of experts and in policy circles, including I received a personal phone call from a senior official at the Trump administration who was very upset with the report. And that signaled to me that we were doing the right thing to piss them off. So after sending the report um, to Thomas Quintana, he was the UN Special Rapporteur on North Korea human rights, he urged governments to hear our message. And he called for the easing of sanctions, especially during the pandemic. And most importantly, he noted the importance of peace in improving human rights. So we've engaged, we've engaged senior officials. Um, you'll see from the top left is Matthew Pottinger. He's the national security advisor for Asia uh, for President Trump. We engaged Deputy Secretary of State, Stephen Began, um, Moon Chung-in from South Korea, the senior envoy to President Moon. And then you'll see that was the meeting at CPCS uh, with Mr. Oh ryong il from um, the National Peace Committee from the DPRK. You know, we, um, we have felt that it is really important to meet and engage with all sides and to encourage them to end the Korean War. And we look forward to doing that with the Biden-Harris administration. Number four, we've built a national grassroots network. And I can't tell you enough how important it is to do this grassroots organizing work. A key part of our work in creating the political space for peace is amplifying the voices from the grassroots. We have a US organizing team that's led by two bilingual Korean Americans, and they have helped build 10 chapters across the United States. Our members are multi-generational Korean Americans. They are peace activists, veterans, students, housewives, small business owners, academics, and they collectively press for an end to the Korean War. They collect signatures on postcards. They organize house meetings. They call and they meet with their representatives. They show up at, at town hall meetings. They write letters to the editors. They tell their personal stories to press their representatives. This is truly a people powered movement led and mobilized by women. And in June, you know, we had actually planned to meet in Washington DC in March, but because of the pandemic, we had to cancel it. But still, we organized a National Advocacy Week with over 200 members conducting over 90 virtual lobby visits with congressional staffers. As a result, we helped secure um, more members of Congress uh, commitment to co-sponsor resolutions that barred President Trump from waging an, an unauthorized first strike against North Korea and supporting the reunion of divided Korean American families. But I would say one of the most exciting things, and lastly, that we have done as this people powered movement led by women is to build Korea peace champions. Our main legislative vehicle for building this political will is a congressional house resolution 152, which calls for an end to the Korean War with the peace agreement. So we worked with Congressman Ro Khanna. He's from California. He's very uh, one of the leading spokespersons on US foreign policy. And we worked with him and provided substantial input to this resolution. And so it was actually introduced right around the Hanoi summit. And so, you know, even though we were beleaguered by the outcome of that meeting, we felt that we had uh, something to organize and to give people hope for. And uh, within a year, we have now um, garnered 53 co-sponsors of this resolution. Now, this may not seem like very much, given that there's 400 plus members of Congress in Washington, DC, but let me tell you, a, de a decade ago, when I was organizing a congressional briefing in Washington, DC, to mark the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, only two members of Congress would support peace with North Korea. And one was 
a well-known peacenik named Dennis Kucinich, who's no longer in office. And the other is Barbara Lee. She was the only woman who stood up in the US Congress to vote against George W. Bush's uh, war on, on Afghanistan and Iraq in response to 9-11. So, um, you know, this is a big deal. And every, uh, now, you know, as we know, uh, there's a new Congress that's gonna be going in and there's gonna be a new um, chairperson of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, which is the committee that is going to basically see through this resolution. And each of the contenders of that House Foreign Affairs Committee chair has endorsed and co-sponsored this resolution. It is a huge deal. And plus we got the first Republican to actually co-sponsor it. So we feel that we're starting 2021 in a very positive footing. And that is the work of civil society. That is the work of people on the ground who are working collectively to make this happen. Now, we have no illusions about the, the long and hard road ahead, um, but we are heartened to know that there is growing support for a peace agreement uh, with North Korea. In fact, a poll that was released by the Data for Progress and YouGov found that 67% of Americans support negotiating a peace agreement with North Korea. And that the highest is actually among Republicans, which, you know, for those of you that understand US policy, politics, that is kind of strange. Um, but that is great news as we go into a democratic uh, administration. We're also seeing the growing support for reducing the military budget. And you know that the United States has the largest military budget, more than the 10 largest countries combined, next largest countries combined. And so um, this is a huge factor that is also helping us make the case to end the Korean War, which has been the longest standing US overseas conflict. So these are all steps in the right direction, but history has told us that there is one element that can improve the outcome of a peace process, and that is the involvement of civil society, especially women's groups. Research shows that when women are involved in peace processes, an agreement is more likely to be signed and to last. Between 1991 and 2017, women's groups were involved in 71% of informal peace processes. So I can tell you that our participation has helped legitimize the formal peace process among the public. We are not back on track with the peace process, but we are helping to ensure that there will be a peace process to end the Korean War. So we need women, we need members of Congress, we need the public, we need all of you, especially in Asia and around the world working together with us to finally bring an end to the 70 year conflict. Our work is so far from over, but as someone whose family was one of the countless Korean families impacted by the war, I believe that we must see an end to this conflict in our lifetimes. And with women leading the way, it can be done. So before we go into discussion, I will show a brief two minute trailer of a forthcoming documentary by Deanne Borche Leem, who is uh, a filmmaker, an award-winning filmmaker about our transnational feminist movement. So um, without further ado, let me do, how do I do the bigger screen? Hang on one second. Okay, here we go. As a daughter of South Korean immigrants, I grew up being told stories about her homeland. This is Korea, a nation divided at the end of World War II at the 38th parallel. These stories made us fear North Korea. And it was something that I never questioned until much later. More than 60 years after the ceasefire, North and South Korea and the US are still technically at war. I decided I needed to meet the people that were supposed to be my enemy. And that's when I started to understand the legacy of a war that never ended. Breaking now in North Korea, women from around the world are preparing to make a demonstration for peace. 
a prominent women's activist group is planning a symbolic and controversial walk across the demilitarized zone. Women are disproportionately impacted by war and violence, and it's time to have a seat at the table. A lot of people say it was naive, and you cannot do this. Several hundred people are here to counter protest against us. Anyone who calls on engagement with North Korea, they've been maligned. If there is not agreement between the two militaries, the government does not feel that our safety would be assured. What are we doing that is so threatening? People think that the only way North Korea can be dealt with is to eliminate it. There is an image that there aren't real people and that they must be destroyed. 시민들 같은 경우는 마음의 분단심이라고 하나요? 마음의 삼팔선들이 있어요, 사실은. This artificial boundary has kept Korean people separated. Okay, and that's it for the presentation. <laughs>